to Mind Brian Liberty Show with me, Swithin Dobson, and him, Tim Patton. Today we discuss power and what actually is power. What got me thinking about this? I was reading some um, some sociology works of some uh, feminists and uh, Marxists, and uh, a heavy strain in their uh, writings is uh, power. Uh, With the Marxists, it's the ruling class. The ruling class are the ones who have power. Um, And the feminists, it's, oh, all men everywhere have power and they create something called patriarchy. That is uh, the the, the rule of males, the rule of men. And I was thinking to myself, well, they keep using this term power. I don't really know what they mean by it. Um, it seems quite a, an amorphous concept. Um, and then it got me thinking, you know, there's other sort of philosophers who talk about power and power dynamics. And the same, so things like Foucault comes to mind, um, you know, to some extent Nietzsche as well. Um, it's, you no. Know, what actually is power? How is power wielded? Who actually has it? And, and I was thinking to myself, well, it's not doesn't seem nearly as um, straightforwardly obvious as to who has power um, as it um, may first seem. Um, I mean, another point would be, you know, the left, economically speaking, would say that um, the corporations have power. But again, that's not really the same sort of power I don't think you say the ruling class has. Or, oh, well, it, it might do insofar as the uh, corporations are sort of uh, inexplicably lined with it. But, um, you know, they, they, they can choose to employ people or choose not to, and other people can choose to work for them or not. But again, oh, the argument is, well, the corporations have a lot of power over the, um, uh, the potential employee. And so related really with this sort of power uh, analysis is somehow that a uh, an inequality of power, especially with the Marxists, uh, the feminists and the economic left, less so with um, Foucault and uh, Nietzsche, is that somehow the uh, power imbalances are bad uh, because it leads to inequality. Uh, so, again, we're kind of getting back to this equality uh, underpinning of things. So and I was thinking to myself, OK, well, we want to talk about power. You know, how can we actually uh, define power? And so I, I thought, well, OK, on the most general level, it would seem to be that power is, a, is, is mean, if you have power, you have the means to achieve your goals. If you can do that, you are powerful in a sense. But then the question is, well, what can you have power? What kind of goals can you have and how can this power help? So I can subdivide it. You can have power over nature and then you can have power over people. I mean, Implicitly uh, with uh, the Marxist analysis and the feminists, etc., the um, uh, ana- the power they're talking about is primarily the people. But of course, um, none of these are stand in isolation with each other; they're interrelated. So I would say power over n- uh, nature to begin with is really what you could call physical power. It's the power to transform nature to your will, and this really is. Uh, to do largely with energy production. I mean, this is something Alex Epstein would uh, talk about, you know, uh, and also to um, to some extent, George Reisman uh, is, you know, if you have more power, as in like electrical power, energy, you can transform the external environment to your will. So um, Las Vegas area is actually a vaguely inhabitable place now because you have air conditioning, whereas previously it would just be pretty darn too hot to uh, really pretty much live there. So that's kind of power over nature. Uh, and, and I think that really leads into kind of economic power to a large extent. I mean, most of the increase of standard of living that people have. Yes, yeah, so people provide services, but that's because they have the tools which can alter nature. Um, which then leads into me uh, nicely into my first of power over people power uh, description. Uh, uh, well, um, types of power. You've got economic power. So if you have economic power, that means you have uh, you can sell goods or services for other goods or services uh, to other people, either directly uh, in sort of direct exchange, sort of like uh, in a barter situation or via money. So if you have more if you have more economic power, it basically means you can purchase more goods and services 
uh, than other people can. So you can uh, put, you can get hold of more material goods than you otherwise would. That means you have economic power. And of course, I say that's directly related to the physical power. Then you've got kind of what I might call violent power, um, which is, you know, you can have someone who is very strong and can overpower somebody else. Uh, so you might want to steal their stuff so you can punch them. So physical bodily power. But obviously then some people are pretty weak, could be able to do that. Why? Because they have a weapon, they have a gun. So you can have like a weaponly power in this context. And also, um, which you must rem remember and a lot of people don't, is that the law is violent. If you can uh, command uh, the legal apparatus, then you can then impose your will violently on other people. So you can arrest people like uh, Piers Corbyn uh, for, um, for speaking outside, really, in London. And then you can get the police to come and take them away. That's a kind of a, a violent power. Um, next, we have a, a relational power. So um, this is a situation where you can get somebody else to change their goals because of what they want. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily change uh, what you value. Ultimately, it's just a case of, well, you'll do it because they like it. Uh, you know, so a good example might be you want to watch the football, but the, your child wants to watch um I know the cartoon. You don't really want to watch the cartoon, but the child wants to do it. You want to make them happy, so you let them watch it. But ultimately, your your value scale, what you would like to, to watch, for example, it still isn't really changed. Uh, and so that's kind of r relational uh, power. Uh, then we have persuasive power. Um, oh, so just go back on relational power as well. This doesn't necessarily have to be on an individual level. It could be on a societal level. So. Uh, societal shame could work on relational power in the way I've described it. So some people wear a mask in a supermarket because, well, they feel like they would be shamed if they if they didn't. They'd be you know, uh, ostracized. They'd be pointed out as being unmutual. And so that, in a sense, given my terminology, would be kind of relational power. Uh, 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 subtly different, but importantly different, is persuasive power. Uh, this way, you don't just get people to change their goals to their goals and you kind of retain your original goal. In this case, you actually change what you want. So this could be anybody saying, you know, you know, actually, you know, lazing around on the sofa all day and getting high probably isn't a good idea. Actually, probably better to clean your room and do a bit of a Jordan Peterson. Um, you know that you could um, that could genuinely change what you think a good life is and make you live differently. Uh, this could be via advertising as to what you want to buy. It could be um, uh, ecclesiastical institutions. It could be the it could be a whole host of different things. It changes your view of things, so it changes your goals. Uh, probably a, a more basic one, which I haven't talked about, which is not really though to do with people. I suppose it's to do with uh, not power over the world, but your understanding of the world. You could call intellectual power. If your goal is to kind of understand the world. The more uh, intellectual uh, ability you have, then the more you can understand it. And then related to that as well, which is more of a sort of theological uh, one, you could say something like spiritual power. You know, uh, you could describe this in a, in a more abstract way as kind of the ability to become closer to the ultimate, whatever the ultimate. The ultimate might just be nature. It, you don't necessarily have to have some sort of theism as such but it's more of a case of well you could be powerful insofar as your goal is to become closer to what is ultimate in the world and then that's the extent you'd have sort of uh, spiritual power and that's kind of similar in certain respects to intellectual intellectual sort of undergirds um uh, all of those um but when it comes to say the, the marxist the feminist etc it seems to me that what they primarily have uh um thoughts about is kind of economic power uh, and violent power that would seem to be the the primary ones that they uh they're, they're talking about but um tim what do you think of my attempted uh categorization of various forms of power have i missed anything out um and of those um which of the powers which institutions do you think hold the powers in various most power in these areas or, or people for that matter are, are the marxists and the feminists right I'm glad you asked that very last question. First of all, I want to state the uh, uh, even though I'm a libertarian, I don't maybe a while ago I would would, would laugh at Marx. But I, I like Hans Hoppe. I think there's a lot to like in Marx. Um, you know, Marx has Hoppe has two lectures. 
what Marx gets right, as well as who exploits whom. And technically, libertarians regarding the state have a kind of proto-argument. Um, now, Ayn Rand has the argument that the big businessmen are the most exploited minority in the United States or Britain or whoever. Um, now, I don't always go that far. You know, we've done an episode on Kevin Carson. I think in some ways it goes both ways. Um, but nonetheless, one of Hans Hoppe's arguments he makes is regarding time preference and whom exploits whom. And um, I'm just starting this off just position the argument here um, um, is that, you know, the apple, the, let's say the employer, the boss, you know, he's going to plant an apple orchard. You have to wait 15, 20 years. That's a huge time preference. The employer, on the other hand, he's going to pay. He's going to play his employees now. So then if he sells the apples more for the labor theory of value um, under Hoppian economics theory, <clears throat> under Hoppian economic theory, technically, uh, uh, the, the, the profit going to the employer is a form of uh, benefit. You know, he's giving the employees a kind of bone. Uh, uh, he's paying them now instead of later. That's time preference. And everything that Hoppe has, and I think is either man, truth and justice, I think is this called. Um, he talks about recipe. And this is very much a physical power in this well, intellectual power. And he says that, like, you know, if you're only using your hands, how many? How many, um, you know, coconuts could you pick? How many watermelons could you pick? Uh, not that many. But if you get a machine, you, you can pick lots more. Now, I know there's a handful of anthropologists who will try to make this argument that, that hunter-gatherers <clears throat> worked less hours than people do now. And I've looked at those, and, you know, I'm going to go back to Matt Ridley. Uh, they did not have running water. Um, they had infant mortality rates that would make, you know, m most of their children would die. Um, um, they use like 250, I think, I think they use like a, each clan, so to speak, would require like a 300 miles. So you have to, re, so you have to reduce the population of the earth to like, you know, 200,000 or something like that to all live like hunter gatherers or something like that. Um, so yeah, so as Hopper points out, we get all these recipes and this is the Randians, the Randians, the Aaron Brooks at all. They'll say the same thing, um, that we get these sort of recipes, you know, we can learn how to build things. You can increase the you know amount of time it takes to create an hour of reading light. That's a good measure of something to do. <clears throat> so yeah, we build all these recipes. So in this regard, power is great. Um, and of course, as Marx points out in his manifesto, you know, the capitalism broke down the idiocracy of the rural life. Um, um, rural life. Uh, I'm not against yeoman farming. I'm not against them all. Um, but whether or not it's competitive or not is of some question. Um, you know, you can't you can't. You can't subsidize uncompetitive things. <clears throat> I was recently listening to um, uh, Paul Gottfried on one, one his show, and he was complaining. He's he's a more of a right environmentalist. And I just the, the comment came up that Paul Gottfried said the all the Amish and Mennonites are selling their land, um, and this to me the libertarian me was saying, no, you should be happy. They're cutting a deal to to sell it to some developer. Uh, the areas where the Amish live will go down in value anyway, so they can move elsewhere. Um, it's the people, not the magic dirt, that makes the society. Um, so, yeah, so we can pray, you can turn lots of areas using recipes. So power is good. Um, and Marxists themselves, they're truly being Marxists, not these sort of weirdo, wacko, primitivist Marxists. Marx was not, you know, <laughs> these wacko primitivists. Um, power is good. Power over nature is good. That's why Marxists built a lot of dams, the dam in the Nile River, the dam up in French Canada. Um, lots of dams are built by. Now, again, I, I'm actually sympathetic to the sort of people who argue that a lot of these dams they built were bad. A lot of their sort of big public works project were, air quote, bad and inefficient. I'm actually I'm actually sympathetic to that viewpoint. Um, but, but you know, tell that to Mr. Nasser or tell that to the um, French Canadians or tell that to the, you know, the various other people or FDR that the Colorado River doesn't and the Nile River don't reach the sea there as well because of their great public works projects, um, um, you know, tell that to all those people. But nonetheless, nature, power over nature in general is a good thing. We've figured out a lot of things. Um, we figured out a lot of things, and this is all great. Um, so uh, now I'm going to get to your, your your point you made about the feminists, <clears throat> because I think that 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 is sort of what struck, to a certain extent sparked the discussion. And I, I sort of view that to a large extent, especially – lately as preposterous. I mean, first of all, Foucault is a lot more sophisticated, um, um, which is why Jacobin writes articles like Foucault must be our enemy. That's not quite the title. But if you read the sub, up sub lines, he's like, why the heck is Foucault reading Milton Friedman or Gary Becker? Is this guy a fascist? Um, um, so, yeah, I, I, I agree that um, 
for Foucault, if you read Foucault, he's not that. He's much more uh, complicated and nuanced. And one of the comments that Foucault actually made is that power flows both ways. And I think in a, in a term of micro view um, in marriage, this is clearly the case, even in patriarchal societies that someone like Gary North would approve of. It's not like, you know, you know, um, it's not like even if you imagine some society proved by Gary North and, and like Comstock um, to bring up some boogeyman's of the past or the handmaiden's tale, um, which is like the feminist sort of wet dream dystopia. Um, um, it, it's quite clear that, that, that it's not like all the women in there have zero power. They have power. They, they were run the rebelling by definition. There's lots of ways you can rebel. There's, and this is this is where micro, in some vague sense, at times agree. But again, one of the interesting things is that you know currently, and there's a great book that Thaddeus Russell was, a great, was on, was the feminist war on crime. Um, and the feminist war on crime is hilarious because it's Slavoj Zizek actually I think agrees with the the premise of the book in the sense that um, a lot of these laws, a lot of the you know you know he has an article he said you know people went looking for Sexism. What they actually found was, you know, a bunch of uh, non-white men were saying uh, not so nice things. I, I love that. I cannot find the post of that link, but I think it's hilarious. But again, a lot of these sort of laws and so forth for, for, are set up in certain ways to favor. And again, marriage laws, example today, are probably set up arguably in favor of the women. Um, so yeah, I, I would argue that when the, the feminists forget, don't forget that power flows both ways, is a Foucauldian point that power flows both ways. Um, and Thaddeus Russell made that book in the freedom of slavery, not this book, Renegades of History of the United States. He argued that like ex-slaves, runaways um, and so forth were had a lot of power in a sense because they were not expected to be polite citizens um, because they didn't have to be polite citizens. Um, they didn't have the the burdens of slavery. And I was going to say Andrew Jackson's um, estate in Nashville, I think. Um, and that was one of the comments that, you know, they they said that, you, you know, I have my own burdens. I actually, in a way, agree with that. Um, um, in, in theory, I mean, for one thing, for one thing, no slave is going to be get the become a historical boogeyman like Andrew Jackson at times has come. So there is there is there's burdens of power too. There's burdens of authority. Um, um, there's a burdens of authority, and this also th shows up to me in employment relationships, as I pointed out. Um, and I, I you forwarded me a link on our discussion over is Kevin Carson the third world list um, that the oftentimes employees want to have their cake and eat it too. Now, again, I'm all in favor of people having their cake and eating too as much as they can. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I like industrialization that allows us to get much more power over the nature. But uh, th there are certain legal devices that I'd argue and certain union contracts that argue that um, make it impossible to innovate or run a effective businesses. One of the arguments of why uh, laborers move out of the developed world into the developing world is the very fact that people charge too, uh, too much, and that's thanks to unions. You know, this is this is the whole Boeing and GM moving to South Carolina and Alabama. Um, now again, this is a this is a comp rather complicated issue because you have, then you have to deal with you know should should American workers compete against Chinese workers, and this is a whole this is this is called goes back right into, to me in the third world at this point. Um, as well, you know, you know, so South Carolinians are more willing to accept $16 an hour instead of the $40 an hour Seattleians are willing to accept. Um, so yeah, power flows both ways. Power is rather complicated. I don't think it's as simple as the, as the feminists make it out to be. So so then, so far, what do you think of what I've said? I would say all the above is is, is but I would say power over nature is foundational to everything. Um, but you can you can continue on that. So then, <clears throat> oh yeah, I'd certainly say. Uh, power over nature is i mean for, for just development in general is incredibly uh, important I, I would distinguish sort of uh, physical power from intellectual power i mean you can have the intellectual power but not uh, to sort of for example um produce an airplane but you might not have the physical power to do it that is um because of your uh i mean so you for example you could imagine uh Oh, maybe maybe we 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 were talking many years of the uh, post coronavirus uh, economy in a similar way that you talk about the post Roman Empire economy in Europe, and it's um, much poorer than it was. Uh, but let's suppose that you could retain the knowledge to create aeroplanes. You may not have the physical power and energy to do it. Uh, so I, I, they are related, but they are distinct. And yeah, of course, you know, without power over nature, you life would be significantly less interesting and a lot more harsh and, and probably boring 
which is something the primitivists and the environmentalists uh, just don't wish to see. Um, I, I do agree, you know, power flows both ways. Um, uh, although it, it's um, so f- given the, the categorizations you mentioned with slaves, I mean, um, no one really has much, many relational power, much relational power over slaves. Like the rest of society aren't going to be able to shame them into doing things that, that society wants them to do well, because they're slaves and not expected to. And if they were, they have kind of that, that uh, you could say that uh, deviant mentality that, of, of being slaves. Uh, and so, you know, they act in other ways. So, they, so they're not going to be constrained uh, by uh, society's expectations of them. Now, they may be constrained by other slaves' expectations of them, but not society as a whole. Um, also, you know, when, when it comes to uh, so, uh, um, the feminists and the Marxists, I mean, I don't think the Marxists get everything wrong, and uh, far from it. And Marx is actually a, a fan of industrial civilization to a large extent. You know, he was about progress in that respect. Um, but what I would say is largely um, the Marxists with a sort of economic materialist determinism uh, and the feminists just by looking at obvious sort of quote unquote obviously powerful stuff primarily just talk about um, economic and violent power primarily it's money and economic power and in you know, who runs the sort of legal apparatus um, that's kind of what they focus on. And you know, who runs that? Well, I mean, the feminists might claim it's run by men, but there's a hell of a lot more women there now uh, than uh, there used to be. Um, same in economic power. I think it's still the case that the biggest earning um, chief executive in England or in the UK is female. Uh, she runs an organisation called Bet365. And I think at least in one year, she was paid something like £265 million in a single year. Um, so economic power and violent power is not as non-diverse as it seems. And that's how uh, Joe Biden seems to be creating his, his cabinet, uh, assuming, of course, he is inaugurated. Um, so, I mean, the economic power and violent power, I mean, it, those are institutions you kind of think of are obvious. So that's kind of corporations, you know, have lots of economic power, obviously, uh, to a large extent. Um, and of course, sort of the, the state um, with, with its power there. Um, now, you I agree, you know, you, some workers have power over um, uh, organisations, but the extent to which there is fewer firms and more workers, I, mean, I suppose that's not unreasonable to say that the firm has, has more economic power uh, in the sense that they can buy and sell more than the, the individual can. Um, what I think the um, feminists and the Marxists kind of underplay uh, is uh, relational and persuasive power, which I think is the most important. Although, actually, to fair, Gramsci uh, does talk about persuasive power quite a lot. But the orthodox Marxists don't primarily because they think, you know, um, any kind of persuasive power or ideology is just sort of built on econo- as, a, as a veneer over economic interests. Um but um, yeah, persuasive power. I mean, who has power? I mean, I mean today, uh, it's not really. I would say, um, you know, it, 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 it's 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 not the, the usual suspects, as it were, of like the, the state or the corporations uh, directly. Uh, except though, I mean, you could say in respect of advertising with corporations. But I think the most in, influential today uh, persuasive power is basically what uh, Manchester Mobile would call the cathedral. You know, it's 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 kind of like the mass media. That is uh, the probably the largest single persuasive body in existence. I mean, previously you'd have churches or other uh, religious institutions, um, but um, they have significantly less power um, than they used to. Um, and you know, that can change a lot of things because if you can change what you think is the right way of acting, then that's of course going to change. Uh, what you do, and this is kind of what uh, Gramsci attempted to do, is it was a way of changing sort of the cultural hegemony, the uh, ideology that people believed, so that then they could uh, remould society eventually into the um, sort of communist uh, utopia. On to the feminists uh, specifically, I think what they miss a, a lot is kind of relational power, 
I think it's the case. Uh, now, are there any institutions as such in this case that cause you to act in a different way? Not really. You have society as a whole, but to what extent it's the institutions in the question um, in the relevant sense? I think when it comes to feminist, relational power, I think it's pretty clear in most cases, if you look at marriages, that it's uh, the, the wife has significantly more relational power uh, than the husband does. I mean, the husband buy, get, gets stuff and, and earns money, but probably doesn't spend it on a huge amount of things. And his wife decides what what's bought instead. Um, you know, he might, uh, you know, change what he's doing to keep the wife happy, etc. There's significant amounts of... Um, of sort of indirect soft power as it were that women have and, th- and that's been clearly seen uh, historically and if you want to take an evolutionary psychological uh, point of view it's something you would expect women can't achieve their goals directly in the same way men can because they're physically less strong on average uh, and um, you know that they've got more to lose from a direct encounter than a man does on average um, also they may be um, endangering dependent children in the way that with their close physical proximity which might not be the case of men so it would make sense that you know they would attempt to achieve their their goals by more indirect methods uh and um this seems to be obviously uh true i mean a, a, another interesting uh point on this i listened to somebody who involved in sort of domestic violence uh kind of sanctuaries for people and said you know when you, when you have like a man to commit domestic violence well you know what, what she did say is that the women are, are sort of equally violent in many of the cases physically um but you know you get kind of controlling behavior it kind of is kind of both ways but again it's not as um kind of um as obvious maybe um i think that um yeah, the, I, I think understandings of where economic power are are relatively reasonably well known. That said, a bad economics, of course, muddies that significantly, especially those on the left who think somehow the the state is going to restrain corporations when in fact they uh, give them even more power than they otherwise uh, would have. Um, but I, I, I think kind of the, the relational and persuasive power. I mean, persuasive power is talked about more than it used to, and this is what Sean Gabb is good uh, on, really, um, insofar as uh, not focusing on persuasive power in terms of arguments, but also kind of like story and sort of indirect argument, because that's something that can be missed if you over-intellectualize things. Um, but yeah, the, the, the feminists are the ones who uh, draw my particular eye with their complete lack of understanding of what I would refer to relational power, which actually gets men to do what they want, uh, which, you know, as I say, from the evolutionary psychological position, you could say is actually kind of have a um, you know, one of their comparative advantages, uh, as it were. So, Tim, on the uh, on the different um, powers that I've uh, distinguished between, apart from physical power and the power over nature, of the ones over people, which of the um, types of power would you say are the most um, important socially i mean which one if you were to take in isolation would you think yeah yeah that's 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 the one i want uh assuming i wanted to, to change society as it were and uh, do you think if i'm being unfair about who controls power or institutions or anything like that or do you think that's what i've said is broadly accurate as far as what is most important um i would argue the the soft power ends up being the most um important uh, you know, you have these sort of thought experiments like what would if everyone stopped believing in the government, um, what would what would people do? Uh, I mean, you get sort of they had a sort of discussion on I was listening to a discussion in Bitcoin um, and they, they, were, they were asking, you know, at what point, you know, would, would there be a run against the Fed into Bitcoin? And he said, like, you know, once it reaches like a sort of critical mass, you know, it, 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 could, it could go it could go through the roof, so to speak. Um, uh, you have a huge exodus. Um, um, so I, I do think relational and soft power and voluntary power um, play a huge role. Uh, this, this is actually one of the ways in which feminists tend to forget that civilization itself, it, it, that women are probably more benefited by civilization thanks to get the, the decreasement of childbirthing, you know, if you think in birth control and things like that. 
Uh, I mean, if you want to have a, a replacement level fertility rate before 19, 18, we'll say 1800, you probably need 10 children per woman um, or something like that or something fairly high. Um, um, rather significant. So, so civilization itself, um, and again, if you don't have a replacement level of fertility, you cannot have any pension program or social security program. I mean, you can try to have it if you can immigration, but again, you're just sort of robbing from other countries, or you can robbing from other areas, or up very, or 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 more industrial growth. There are ways around this, more robot robotized automata uh, automation. But you know, you have to sort of maintain some stock of a populace to, to pull this program off. So if you if you talk about Social Security or pensions, tell me where you're going to get the future workers to pay for them. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I, I, they are the primary benefits. And actually, the handicapped and the all the other groups, they're also the primary benefits of civilization. The, the primitive society does not have handicapped ramps or, you know, pro prosthetic limbs or you know, insulin, you know, people complain about the prices of these things. And I agree. Hashtag Kevin Carson. Let's get rid of intellectual property. Let's, you know, so blah, 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 and so on, so on, so on. But do that. Don't like get rid of markets and, um, you know, and don't like ban all fossil fuels. Um, so, but yeah, I agree that voluntary power is very relevant, um, uh, which is persuasive power. And actually, this is one of the arguments that the uh, slaveholders who are sort of not persona non grata, um, currently make used to make people like Henry Sal C. Calhoun and I you know he, I've been to a number of these plantations and you know after the Civil War a lot of the slaves and people and maids and all people would stay now again I'm well aware that it's that you know I'm well aware blah I, I'm purely aware that there's you know lots of people where I, you don't need to remind me that um, but then again you know being a yeoman farmer in North Dakota was you know again you had you had freedom in the way certain ways but you know, you also had you also had to deal with the similar harsh working conditions. If you're a coal miner in Pennsylvania or or northern England or southern England, you probably didn't have the best. Probably, better, you had lots of or other freedoms. I agree. Um, but the, the just the fact that work had onerous jobs did not necessarily mean that almost everyone had onerous jobs in the past. Um, <laughs> almost everyone had onerous jobs in some ways. Um, so yeah. I think relational power, voluntary power is the most important. And this is where this is where actually, you know, you know, you know, women actually today probably hold more power in certain ways, um, um, in certain ways. Um, now, this gets complicated because this was the Camellia Pagulli argument, which is, the, you know, the reason men fill the prisons and um, fill um, all the CEO boards or ought to fill all the CEO boards in innovation positions is the same reason, um, you know, men, men, men. Yeah, men have a high, men have a less on average payout. They'll, their payout is more fat tailed in certain ways. You know, they're born poor and die wealthy. Women on the other hand are the reverse. So, so that's another way that 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 you know, you know, the feminist um, to a large extent miss um, this entirely. Uh, um, as far as the other powers is concerned, um, I, I'm going to reiterate like, the Marxists tend to the Marxists make this sort of claim that there's exploitation occurs, which I, I mean, I, you know, if they, if they keep it, if they keep it technical and, and isolated, I'm actually 100 percent. I might be brought around to agree with it. But there's other issues at stake oftentimes. Um, and this goes back to your other episode. If people choose to have masters, um, if people choose to have masters. Now, again, people say, well, that's a silly thing. No one, no one actually chooses to do that. I, 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 I Yes and no. I mean, again, you know, running running your own business is not easy. Now, it could be made easier if you got rid of certain licensing laws, which or or regulation and so forth. Um, but in a, in a certain way, you have to sort of deal with the future. You have to deal with what consumers want, um, your, what your clients want. You don't you don't get to you know you know you don't get to shirk or so to speak. I mean, you can if you want, but you just you know, will your clients want to do that? Um, so, yeah, there's certain ways in which um, these type of things are more difficult. So, so Swithin, what do you make so far of my things? I, I think persuasive power is, is, is probably the most important, um, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm a libertarian. Um, whether we can do away with hard power um, violence, and so to speak, is of some question. Whether you go full pacifist, I'm skeptical of that um, entirely, um, I, I, and for a variety of reasons. 
I do think there are um, I do think there are things that have to just be done um, with with violence to, to, to do away. Um, you know, you look out, you look out, you know, the Soviet Union, after all, defeated the Wehrmacht using pure violence. You know, there was no, there's no, not much really, not much persuasive power there. So I do think there is, uh, I do think there is also, also a place for coercive power and exactly, and that is relevant for libertarianism. I do think defending property is, is relevant. I mean, as David Friedman points out, you know, the, 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 the root of the root no one thinks no one thinks everyone has a right to use a woman's body. Um, they think that their body is a dictatorship. They, they have a they, they think the woman owns their own body. Um, um, you know that claim is never brought up. And I guess if you go to Plato, they have sort of borderline communal ownership of of people. Um, um, uh, you know this is this and this is oftentimes what the feminists will claim that the historical marriage is as well. Um, not which. Is to a certain extent true and to a certain extent is false, and a lot of and a lot of the problems is that the past was just much more onerous in the sense that there's a lot more onerous labor because we didn't have as much industrialization, so it's made the world a lot nicer place in certain ways. But Swithin, what do you make so far of my further comments on, on what's the most important? I would agree with you on uh, persuasive power being the most important. Um, I agree that because. You know, if you can change what people want to do, then that's almost everything. Uh, obviously, they need the power to be able to do so, the physical power to, to manifest it in the world. But, you know, if you can change what they want, then, you know, um, you know, that's the most powerful thing you can do. Now, it might not be the case that you can actually convince everyone to do what you think they should do. And that's the case uh, primarily with what you might consider as criminals or the uh, or foreign invaders. Uh, they think what they're doing is right. Um, although this then goes to the episode of whether people um, can knowingly do something they know is wrong. Um, we leave that aside. But broadly, but in one sense, we could say, well, they, they are doing what they want to do. And so in certain circumstances, you simply cannot persuade them otherwise. And so you need violent power. Uh, you know, which, you know, which links into economic power, of course, of physical power over nature. Um, that's um, certainly certainly true. So I, I wouldn't say there's only persuasive power. But what I would say was is that the fact that the other people are acting in a antisocial way is because they have goals and have been persuaded by something or someone. Although you could say it's an act and they choose not to. So I suppose holding persuasive power out as being ultimate would be some sort of, sort of external determinism of a certain description. Um, but um, broadly speaking, you know, they are doing what they do because they think it's the right thing to do. And something I completely forgot with persuasive power about the institutions as to which uh, uh, organizations are really important institutions. I completely forgot to talk about the, um, the public schooling system um, because they have children from the ages of like five to 18 for what five six hours a day five days a week for 36 weeks of the year for 15 13 years or so which is pretty darn uh a lot and also what's interesting as well with the feminists is, uh, and they'll they'll complain about this but lots of the teachers are, are women these days it's like well, i'm pretty sure you have power over other uh people I mean, especially boys um also related to that they will also complain that uh, on, on an early level like child care they're all women it's like well okay well you're raising all these boys don't you have any power over them oh no 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 somehow you know the patriarchy somehow given the women who are raising or or looking after these boys somehow false consciousness and so they are imbibing the all the patriarchal stereotypes which are then are then imposing upon the boys uh, because what i mean that that's the bizarre tale they have to spin um on the one hand they'll complain that men don't do anything in response to child rearing um and then uh, on the other hand uh they will complain that women have to do it all and there's patriarchy it's like what they, 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 both of those don't work um so 
yeah, the, the, that's 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 what I think is is relevant there. But as I said, with persuasive power, it's not just arguments. People persuaded by lots of other things. I mean, that's where you get like subliminal advertising. It's like, oh, we're just going to the uh, the the old intermission and, and, and cinemas. We're just going to put like in the background that you can't really see very well, but like, pictures of ice creams. So then you go, oh, ice creams. I'll go, I'll I'll, I'll go and. Um, and buy that and then you've got things like advertising which is influential to some extent other to what extent advertising influential is another question going on uh from this uh which is really i think uh underlining sort of the critiques of power from um particularly say the marxists and the feminists is somehow that power imbalances are bad uh so the question is well are they bad and, and, and assuming that they were bad how could you actually re- Juice power imbalances without giving somebody else loads of power to make sure that everybody else's power was somehow more in check. What do you think, Tim? Well, that's the million dollar question. Um, well, first of all, when the Marxists, when, when the people on the broadly speaking on the left, and I've defined left colloquially and technically, um, as well as the right, of course, to complain about power. Um, uh, and, well, first of all, in order to say something is bad or requires a worldview or some kind of theology or sometimes the conception of good, so we don't want to go back to that other episode we did and what exactly is the good. Um, but you know, and as Foucault points out, is the anarcho syndicalists, and this is what Foucault would point out, Chomsky said, anarcho syndicalists basically had more or less basically bourgeois models of family and what a, exactly good life works out, and you know, um, you know, there's an article, an article in the Guardian that's. You know, they said that Marx would have proved of home ownership. Uh, now, again, I, I agree. Nothing wrong with home ownership. Get rid of the stupid public school taxes here in the United States, and you can make it a lot easier for people to own their own homes. Um, and again, the, the one of the least one of the least one of the least discussed elements of power, which I think is rather the, the easy explanation why it doesn't get discussed, is that the critical theorists and the teachers themselves are employed by the, inst- the institution of the public schools. I mean, the, you know, for all the talk of bossism. You know, the most brutal bosses I've had are public school teachers or college professors. I mean, you know, the last hour I spent in college was sitting in front of the board of a, of a dip, the dip, uh, you know, department giving a presentation on democracy. Um, again, I mean, I mean, again, talk about power. I mean, they had the they had the right to judge whether it was very expensive, edu- whether I got credit and passed or didn't. I mean, talk about power. That's lots of power. Uh, and one and, and I and one of them was a woman. Um, half of them were women. So it's like. You know, where is, <laughs> you know, I think three quarters of my college professors were women. I once added that up. Um, you know, the chair of the hist- history department at university is a woman. She was a feminist, too. Um, I think she wrote her thing on. Now, again, good good for her. I mean, well, well you know, I, I don't bemoan, you know, I think, I, think, I think if malice is bemoaning other people's success, I don't bemoan other people's success um, um, in any way. Uh, I just think that, you know, the whole. You know why? Why are tax dollars spent there? Why will middle class people throw a whole fortune at these institutions? Um, um, who knows? So yeah, the least discussed manifestation of power to me is arguably the public schools and the universities, where you have professors grading your papers. And, and you know, again, I mean, you know, you know, at, you know at, at manual labor jobs in some ways are extremely liberating in the sense that you do the work um, and you're done. <laughs> no one, no one cares what you think about Trump. Uh, Corbin or you know no one cares what you think about that at least for now for now although they might start going after them um, you know people have um, dodgy views on that um, and things aren't always what they seem you know a lot of the underclasses in the United States that are traditionally thought of on the left actually hold very uh, and I think the same cases in Britain actually hold rather politically incorrect views that's actually one of the arguments Thad Russell made about like the black underclass was not all under King and a King Martin Luther King, you know, in this regard is again, as a sort of bourgeois conservative, which again, I'm fine with, I'm sympathetic to bourgeois conservatives like Gary North and so forth. Um, um, I, I think the, the, the politically incorrect King is actually correct in that. He actually said that he's, and this is what got Thad banned. Um, <laughs> he said that, you know, they weren't, they weren't full citizens because they didn't deserve to be, or that's basically what he said. I won't repeat the exact words he uses because I think it's I think it's it's higher, so no one needs to do it. And if you're really interested, you can go look it up. Um, but nonetheless, that's the least discussed manifestation of 
of power. Um, and how, how do you get rid of how do you get rid of power balances? Well, I mean, again, I would I would take a standard libertarian approach. Um, maybe this would end in tyranny. That that that's one possibility. That's all the critics of libertarian, including minarchists, would argue that an anarcho-capitalist stand would be uh, a tyranny. And, and you know, the, the, I I'm somewhat sympathetic to the idea that you know the best intentions will go awry to a certain extent. That that might be the case. That might be the case. Um, um, but I, I, I still I don't really know how do you disresolve power imbalances. I mean, I mean education, and I'm not just talking about how many degrees you have. I'm just well, not it's train so you don't want to mistake your education for learning. But like the ability to so say take take laying bricks or building houses, you know, it's a skill that basically in the Randian parlance can be judged um, fairly objectively. Um, you know, it's hard to judge whether or not a paper is good. But, you know, if a house, you know, you blow wind out of house, it doesn't fall over. You know, you can stand, you can jump on the third floor. You can, you know, you know, you can you can sort of figure out what's a good house and what's a bad house. Um, you know, so, so those are those are the recipe skills. But those aren't evenly distributed. Uh, the, the skills to do those things aren't even distributed. the skills to, to um, create, um, to cut hair. Um, the ability to to produce children is not evenly distributed. That's 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 for now. Again, again, I know there's surrogacy. Uh, I I think there. Are, I'm not sure if there's test tube babies. I know there's a lot of, of of sort of technology on the fringe that exists. But in general, and, and this was definitely true up until like 1960, there's really only one way to produce another generation of humans, and that's you know in a very um in in, in a in a certain way. Now, again, there's sex negative feminists and there's sex positive feminists. Um, um, but nonetheless, the, the, the skills to produce scarce goods. Um, and I agree we don't live in as, as scarce of a society um, as we did 50, 100 years ago. I think the GDP of the United States in current terms in 1950 was only like 12,000. It's like 40. Well, again, purchasing power, there's different numbers to calculate it. And then again, I... I, I am sympathetic to the idea that certain ways that maybe recent past might be more slightly wealthier, but I, I would argue the way to balance power is to actually, to some extent, empower people. But I, you know, the, the, that's that's complicated because you give people power, um, um, uh, you know, you, you know, it, it become you start becoming your master, and then other problems start to get. So I, I don't have any clear solution. Uh, I don't have any clear so solution other than the standard libertarian answer. Um, I, I don't think the Marxists have a clear solution. And if you look at if you look at their Marxist attempts at it, they I, they they generally just disavow them, or they'll just or they'll defend them, which is fine. I mean, I would argue Fidel Castro has a lot in common with Mussolini. <laughs> I know that's a very politically incorrect thing to say, hey, man. Uh, I think Fidel Castro clearly has a lot in common with the late um, guy in Spain. That the um, anarcho syndicalists fought against, especially the later, the second generation uh, socialist dictatorships, I think have a clear commonality. Um, so if you look at their projects to emancipate people, um, they end up being sort of sort of pseudo reactionary societies. Um, um, so so you know, how do you that that's the million dollar question? I have no clear answer. You could improve people's ability to produce. Um, um, you, you can try to redistribute money, but even redistribution schemes. The trouble is, unless people voluntarily do redistribution schemes, you're, you you can game them. That's another thing that you can game. The, the, now again, I'm not I I I'm not against gaming things. You know, you know, gaming the tax code. You create a complicated tax code. Um, you can hire accountants and tax auditors and various other people. Well, you can try to get you the best deal they can. I'm I'm t Please do that. Although this this becomes us, this is like a burden around people's neck having a complicated tax system because it actually hurts the lower classes the most in the sense they can't afford to have this complicated tax system. But Trump, Kamala Harris, and all these other you know Gates, etc., Soros, um, uh, the guy who owns Twitter, they can have the complicated things. The lower people they can't. So you know, simplify things. Although Rothbard thinks the opposite way, but I, I, I that kind of dispute, I'm very, I, I, I don't know what to think on that dispute um, as far as the, the existence of the state. But those are those are be my proposals. Um, um, I, 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 not all problems have easy solutions. 
And this one doesn't have an easy solution at all. And actually, the gender, a lot of the things about the gender imbalances go both ways. I mean, again, I, you know, I, why are more men? I, one of the things, men fill the prisons. Men commit more suicides. Um, feminists tend not to talk about that. And actually, like, men pay more alimony. Men pay more all sorts of things. So, you know, there's lots of a laundry list of things that can be made. Um, but Swithin, what do you make so far of my bit of a dissertation there? Oh, I, I would I would agree that um, uh, primarily with the uh, way of trying to reduce uh, the power imbalances by uh, making the the um, sort of tax system and other things more simple, so that the little man can um, use the system for his benefit. Um, uh, but what I, what I was going to say uh, was firstly that when it comes to power, I mean, I don't think we ever want to reduce physical power. Um, back to Alex Epstein, what makes human life now better than it was in the past is because we can control nature uh, better than we could before. We can manipulate it to do what we want it to do. And so there, really, we want massive energy generation because the more energy you have, the more stuff you can do. So the fact that... Um, you know, um, the Britain has, well, no, we now have worse power stations because they're now windy and they're just on the edge of uh, the sea. And if it doesn't wind blow, then we have no power. Uh, the fact that certain countries like China have things like coal power stations, which actually create electricity, is a good thing. Uh, and um, all these are like nuclear energy, you know, the, the more energy you have, the better, because the better you can transform nature. Now, when it comes to sort of power imbalances uh, with uh, the rest of them or the r relational between uh, men is I mean, the fundamental point is you can't get rid of them. It's just not possible. I mean, everybody is different. Uh, inequality is a fact. And the only real way to completely eliminate them and have sort of like an egalitarian utopia is to have um, an, a, a one huge, powerful organization which imposes equality on everybody else, which, of course, defeats the whole project uh, pro um, defeats the whole objective because you actually end up giving one organization even more power than everybody else so you end up in sort of a Harrison Bergeron territory which is a Kurt Vonnegut uh, short story where there was just all I think it was even a quality of uh, mental abilities so that's intellectual power because the, the cleverer people if they're thinking better ideas than others they would then have uh, be uh, have electric shock be have electric shocks applied to them so that they could no longer think as as well, because otherwise it would be unequal. Also, another problem with trying to get rid of the power imbalances, this is the ones with the feminists, is um, it, it, it's not immediately obvious which of these powers are better than each other's, because they're, they're, they're kind of related and they're interrelated. But, I mean, if you kind of gave, uh, let's suppose men and women were equal in economic power, I mean, they're not going to get equal on relation, relational power. Or, or let's suppose men have more economic power, women have more relational power. I mean, which one's more important? In, in a sense, it's very difficult to aggregate them. I mean, in the abstract, you can. I mean, we've, we've agreed that kind of persuasive power is probably the most important overall. But in specific circumstances, you know, which power is um, more important and which sort of, as it were, gets the job done, what you, achieves the goal you want to uh, get at. Um, it, it, it's, it's not immediately obvious. Um, so, I mean, uh, with, with feminists, it's like, oh, no, men have all the economic power. Well, yeah, fine. But, like, um, women have it much easier to, uh, if they're, especially if they're attractive, to have somebody who will provide lots of material resources for them very easily. Um, they have that power, have that, that that kind of relational power, which means they can achieve lots of material uh, products very easily, whereas men can't do that. Uh, now, of course, you know men might earn more in the, uh, the economic arena, but for whom do they provide the money, or who, do, you know, what do they want it to to use it for? I mean, so for example, I mean, I think is it, is it? I'm pretty sure, like uh, at least two thirds of retail spending is done by women, if I remember correctly. Now, no, they'll say, oh no, it's just corporations making women need to buy things. I mean, they'll go down that line. Um, but, you know, who spends the money and who earns it is not necessarily the same thing. And I, I just think that you know, different people are going to have different 
amounts of power and different levels. And it's very difficult to a large extent say who's overall more powerful. I mean, in certain circumstances, it's kind of obvious. But in lots of circumstances, it isn't. And um, there's no real way of of getting rid of it. So you may as well learn to live with it and uh, use it to your, uh, your your advantage of what you have uh, and, and try and make the best of what you have rather than complaining that uh, other people have uh, are doing well. I mean, as you mentioned uh, before, you know, you know, as you say, it was, uh, Malice was not liking something other people doing well. Uh, I, I think ultimately this is what a lot of the uh, feminist Marxist and leftist critiques is just envious. Other people are doing better than other things and they want to pull them down a peg or two, which is why I think what's the revolutionary class of the upper middle classes, because they pretty much have everything apart from complete sort of top of the, uh, uh, they're just not complete top of the hierarchy. And so they disdain those people above them. And so they're the uh, revolutionary class. Um, so, yeah, those would be my uh, overall thoughts. Tim, any final comments? Um, as I think it's, I think one of the interesting things is, which sort of, you know, if God exists, he works in weird ways, um, um, is the fact that the most famous woman um, in the United States, you know, there was a famous, there's a thing about the most influential books in the United States, and after the Bible, number two was a woman who wrote it, um, but it was, it's not some feminist, it's Ayn Rand, um, <laughs> it's Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, it's probably the most, you know, second most influential book in the United States, supposedly. Um, whether that's true or not, I think the very fact that that that, that fast fact exists um, um, is is uh, to evidence that it is influential. And considering the amount of hate toward um, the Rand Randians and so forth, I, I I think it's I think it's rather befitting. Um, she I means she has she has a ton of persuasive power, and she does follow the Gab line. She wrote fi- fictions uh, personifying um, great men. Um, now again, as Michael Malice would point out, this is you know, you know, hashtag BDSM in the bedroom. Um, the the famous rape scene. I think it's an Atlas shrugged. Um, so yeah, Rand 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 is the you know Rand is the Rand is, Rand is the perfect bellwether to a certain extent. Watches this episode. Um, I mean, and Rand's also a a, a refugee, an immigrant. And so um, we're told on and on to we have to listen to immigrants um, and the other. Um, although although which others are we supposed to listen to? Um, I mean. We only were supposed to listen to certain others. Um, so, yeah, you know, the fact that Rand has all those persuasive power to me is 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 quite hilarious, quite awesome. And, you know, it is fun to control the enemy, so to speak. But those those are my general comments around around persuasive power. Um, it, it's very relevant. Um, it's very relevant. Uh, I, I, I do think a quick aside needs to. And, uh, no more quick asides. I, I, I think we'll wrap it up here. It's been very nice talking to you on this, um, Swithin? I think that's an excellent uh, note to leave on, that Ayn Rand is one of the most influential uh, characters in uh, America and history. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone for listening. Uh, if you've enjoyed the show, please uh, share it with your friends and family and subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, um, the more uh, subscribers we have, the uh, higher we're getting search rankings and more people can find material like this. And if you'd like to contact the show with ideas or just comments, um, please contact us at mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com. That's mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com.